international property funds and some of the opportunities and the risks that are involved. Um, we're going to wrap that up very quickly, Kirby. Uh, take us through, I think currency is very important right now. And with a very strong rand, everyone's saying this is a great opportunity to head into any international asset. Well, if you just look at it from a valuation perspective, markets are fair. So we know that uh, the rand... Markets are fair. Markets are fair. <laughs> markets are <laughs> well, I suppose, you know, when, you say mar when I say markets are fair, you know, they're not cheap, they're not expensive. Yeah. They're fairly priced. You yeah. know, you're going to need some earnings in order to make them you know, to make them make them far more more far more attractive, so to speak. <laughs> but yeah. if you look at uh, if you look at currency, currency is the one bet that I suppose you could take quite quite conveniently. You know, we know the market, the rand will probably blow out from these levels over here. But just, I mean, something else to maybe just consider at this stage: if you're going to be investing in any global asset class, look how different the earnings are. I will so, let me share what what difference currency can make to to uh, to returns. What I'm showing you over here is a is a chart, and I've rebased it to a hundred. Uh, it shows the big broad base index of, of real estate in rands and in dollars. The blue line is in dollars and the red line is in rands. Yeah. Now they look very similar today. So if you go and you look at the time point right now, you'll see that they look very, very similar. But there was a time during latter part of, uh, of, of 2009 that you could see a major divergence between the two, depending if you're a dollar-based investor or rand-based investor. Now most South Africans are rand-based investors. We don't see our dollar-based earnings as something completely different. We always convert it back into rands and it's something to consider if you're going to be placing uh, uh, money globally. Maybe just a question for Jamie. Jamie, um, just on the back end of that, we've seen major balance sheet strain for many of these global REITs. Um, if we go back to the financial crisis, specifically the subprime crisis, we've seen many of them having to come back to market in order to ask for some more capital. Are we seeing that strain going away now? Yes, I think definitely on the whole, the listed property sector has got their balance sheets in order. In fact, some might say that some of the um, some of the funds raise too much cash and are actually sitting with dead cash on their balance sheet at the moment, literally earning 0% interest. Um, and the growth will potentially come from them buying assets and being able to convert that 0% earning cash into, into cash yielding sort of 6 7% depending which assets they can buy. Um, so on the whole, definitely the guys have got their loan to values. Um, I mean, in order, it's generally sort of 30 to 40 percent at the moment. Some of the guys between 40 and 50 percent, but um, and they've also they've also managed their debt maturity. A lot of the guys have taken this opportunity of low interest rates to to push out some of their debt and and just have a nice blend of long dated debt, um, which matches their 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 lease expiry profile as well. Um, it, the the balance sheet issue definitely was a huge cause of of, of what happened and. 2008 and 2009, um, earnings didn't come off radically. In, in fact, in most cases, they stayed flat and in certain cases actually even went up. It was a balance sheet issue where asset values came down radically and suddenly um, companies were breaching covenant, breaching loan to value covenants, either having to put in cash, sell assets or raise cash uh, from the capital markets and, and generally from, from shareholders. And that that put pressure on share prices. All right, on that note, it's now time for our fund focus. Now is the time where we focus on a specific fund to analyze some of its technicalities. This week, we're reviewing the Catalyst Global Property Fund. So let's get right into it. Kirby, uh, over to you, a fund that is worth $112 million. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's great for a you know, South African fund manager to have yeah. that kind of assets under management. And, you know, just the quality that's, that Catalyst fund managers is, I believe that, you know, they'll be able to exponentially grow that over time. Just to give you an indication here, the managers that manage this fund is Andre Stadler. He's also the chief investment yeah. Uh, officer for Catalyst Fund Managers, and then he co-manages that with Jamie, who's who's obviously now in, in the in the Cape Town mm -hmm. studios. Formation date here is about November 2007, and the objective is the UBS Global Real Estate Investors Index. And you can look at the TER there at about uh, at about 1.7 percent. You know, really not really not too 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 bad. Not 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 expensive at all. Um, just look at uh, just look at numbers here. 12 months, 20.2 versus 24.3. So we're seeing some underperformance over over the short term. Midterm, 24 months, 50.3 versus 51 percent. You know, there you go. You know, two years number. You know, you've made 50 percent per annum. You know, that's 100 percent doubled up. You know, so I mean, that's a that's a significant return for you know for property. And then over three years, you're obviously dragging with you some of the subprime numbers mm. still. And there you're seeing a return of about 3.9 percent, outperforming the UBS Global Investors Index. Let's have a look. 
look quickly at how this fund has actually performed over time. And then we're going to give Jamie the opportunity to talk a little bit more about his, about his fund. Um, just what you're looking at about uh, at here again is the outperformance or the underperformance relative to the UBS Global Investors Index. So when you see a blue shaded area that's above the line, then obviously that's, there's an outperformance and then this would signify an underperformance over here. And that you obviously read off the axis on that side over there. Um, the other line is on the rolling 12-month basis obviously shows you the performance of the benchmark. And you can see that coming out of the crisis, you've seen some really decent outperformance for this fund. On the rolling 12-month basis, you see the outperformance often you know, as high as 15 to 20% 20, 20 beyond benchmark, which is really, really quite good. And then you see the fall down over here or the returns that obviously look quite similar to benchmark and then some, some, some underperformance. And that is as the market continues to revert and continue to do fairly well. We obviously see in some form of fall down. As again, the red line you read again is in absolute terms and you read it off this axis that you see over here. Maybe just a question, Jamie. We've seen outperformance for this fund. We've seen underperformance for this fund. Just give us an indication here of some of the philosophical things that you guys are considering, some the process things you guys are considering and why we're we seeing that uh, that disparity yeah I think if you if you look at the divergence from from where the uh, where the index is I think initially we got um, regional allocation calls um, right uh, underweight the the US and, and overweight Asia X Australia was, was probably the biggest the biggest calls that we got right and then I think we also quality underlying properties was was our was what we focused on as well and i think you know in a crisis if we take for example in a, in a south african context because it's probably a little bit easier to understand if we look at the retail market a large regional shopping center is probably going to be more resilient than say a strip mall for example because the majors and mr price whatever they're not going to close their store in canal walk they're probably going to close a couple of other stores elsewhere if they're under pressure. But if they close their store in Canal Walk, it's going to take them 20 years to get back in there. So I think the quality definitely shone through um, during the crisis. They obviously came off radically, but they didn't come off as much as some of the other counters during that period. Um, and, then, and then you've seen a recovery since then. And I think some of, you know, conversely to that, uh, probably from mid-2009 onwards, some of the higher beta players have, have, have come through through a little bit, and that's probably where we've gotten it a little bit wrong. Um, yeah, the apartment REITs in the US were really strong from sort of April, May 2009 onwards, um, and yeah, we, we, we probably missed that a little bit, but I think overall, you know, you're not gonna, not gonna always get everything right, and uh, we, we're pretty comfortable where we are at the moment. Okay, Kobe. I mean, firstly, your mm -hmm. sense in terms of the fund and whether you think the benchmark is the right benchmark to use. Uh, of course, uh, we're looking at the UBS Global Real Estate Investors Index mm -hmm. and the fact that, as you mentioned, we mm -hmm. have seen underperformance. Of course, there has been a re-weighting and a re-look in terms of mm -hmm. uh, geography and sector as well. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with mm -hmm. the re-weighting? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, you need to find, and again, remember, this is a sector which is developing. It's not yeah. quite as far ahead as what we see. The equity sector, for instance, is as far as development is concerned. But you need to use something. And I think the UBS uh, you know, benchmark is a fairly decent benchmark to utilize. Remember that also just divergent here from, from benchmarks from benchmark for the fund, you know, is either going to you know, have outperformance or underperformance to, to affect. Remember, they've got a philosophical and a process layer which kind of underpins what they're trying to achieve, which is kind of drives this bottom-up process that they talk about all the time. Maybe, Jamie, just quickly take us through this. I mean, I look at the U.S. Uh, the US weighting in the index. We're looking at $197 yeah. billion. Just to put that into context for South African viewers, you know, the South African property unit trust and loan stock market is only about $17 billion. So I suppose your very first risk that you guys have to think about is, am I going to be in the U.S. or am I not going to be in the U.S.? And if I'm not going to be in the U.S., what am I going to be in? And am I happy with that kind of, am I happy with the risk that that kind of has for the portfolio? Just some of your thoughts around that. Yeah, I think, uh, look, we are slightly, we are underweight the U.S. at the moment. Um, it trades it, you know, if you look at the, the, the funds available for distribution or the fad yield that, 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 that the counters trade on, the U.S. on average is trading at about, you know, 4.5% at the moment, uh, where the index is trading at about 5.3% at the moment. Um, we do see more growth in the U.S., um, you know, because they've got, they've got vacancies that they, can, that they can fill. You know, the market is at the bottom at the moment where some of the other markets have started recovering already. 
but we obviously just don't see as much growth potential as as the rest of as the rest of the market do. We, you know, there, there is growth there, but we don't want to pay for for blue sky growth that that may not um, translate. And I think if you look at the if you look at the yield spreads of where the listed sector in each region is trading versus where their ten-year government bond yield is trading mm -hmm. at the moment, I, I think if you look at um, Singapore, um, Australia, places like that, there's a there's a nice yield spread that you can play there with nice growth coming through. And as I, as I spoke about, Singapore has got good growth coming through. The, the Singapore and Hong Kong markets are a little bit more cyclical. The lease terms are a lot shorter. Lease terms in those two markets, on average, around three years. Whereas in the US, the UK, and Europe, it's probably 10 to 20 years, depending which, which market you're in. So things are smoothed a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, we have to definitely see a little more value in, 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 um, in Asia, X Australia, and, and, and starting to see some value in Australia as well. We've been underweight Australia um, until the end of last year. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a sector that's really unloved by the local investment um, community in Australia. Uh, the Australian listed property companies started doing some really weird and wonderful things during the good times. They started taking money offshore. They started creating unsustainable income streams. Yeah. I think they've, they've definitely cleaned up their act. They've um, consolidated things. A lot of the counters are, are Okay, are Jamie, unfortunately now. we have the to wrap this up. We have run out of time. You have three seconds, Kobe. Wrap it up quickly. Good, luck. good luck, Roland. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, that was very insightful. <laughs>